We're going to be in the book of Exodus for all of tonight. There's going to be a couple other verses that'll be up for you. While you're turning there, I just want to recap for us real quick our theme for the year. So for 52 weeks, pretty much, we've been yelling freedom at the end or the beginning of every service, right? And I pray that this was something that we didn't just yell out because Waxer was here and we didn't want to get the shame look, right? I, I pray that this was something that we truly believed in because our freedom was purchased for us with the highest price. Our freedom was purchased for us with the blood of our Lord and Savior. And that is why we can shout and not just shout, but celebrate the freedom that we have. And so all year what we were talking about is freedom and what that looks like. Now, we know that freedom, we learned this at the beginning of last year, freedom is not found in doing whatever we want, right? We, that's what we did before Jesus, and we saw how that went. Freedom is not the word we would use for that, right? Bondage, slavery, pain, heartache, these are the things that we'd use for doing whatever we wanted, right? And so if we have freedom, it doesn't look like what the world says freedom looks like. Because what the world says is if you're free, you can do whatever you want and nobody can stop you. Believers, if you are free, it means I do whatever the Lord asks and I am free to do so. And we learned with our benediction verse that what are we doing with that freedom? We're loving and we're serving. That's a use of freedom right there. I am free to love others and not just myself. And I am free to serve and be a blessing to others and not just myself. Now, in Exodus, they have the same concept of freedom, right? This is kind of the, the mantra that's all throughout. God is the one who set them free. God is the one who set them free. God is the one who set them free. Now, when Israel was freed from Egypt, what did they want to do with that freedom? Go back to Egypt. And that's why we, we, we beat this drum over and over and over again, right? This is Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Why were you set free? For freedom, so that you could be free. This is the whole point, right? Why does he buy our freedom? So that we can be free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. So this is us, right? As believers, we have been set free. We should not then go back into slavery. When we look at Israel as an example, Israel, set free. All their issues dealt with, right? They're off in the promised land. And what do they keep telling Moses? You just brought us out here to die in the wilderness. We want to go back to Egypt because they had garlic and melons and leeks. Never mind the whips and the beatings and the slavery. Forget that's not, never mind all of that. We're okay with that. At least we knew we was going to have ono food, yeah? And so they have this desire to go back to the land of bondage because they're focused on the good things. And if we're not careful, we will do the same. How many of us have had addictions and there's that thought in our head like, what's, what's fun for like five minutes? I remember, and nobody go find out, it's just one time, right? We have, the, we have this desire, this thing in us that pulls us back into bondage. I want us to have just a visual picture of what that looks like when Christ sets us free and we have a desire to go back. Can we play that video, please? we go, and freedom! <laughs> yeah, it's hard looking in the mirror, huh? Yeah. That hurt a little bit more than I think we let on in that one, yeah? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God breaks the chains, sets Israel free, and they want to jump back into the ditch. And we go, Israel's so dumb. <laughs> it's not just Israel, y'all. How many times have we longed for the world before we knew Christ? How many times have we longed to go back? It'd be so much easier if these things were gone. And the enemy blinds our eyes to see the true value of freedom. Like I said, it was purchased for us with the highest price. It is so precious and valuable that your Savior died that you might have it. Do not squander freedom. What do we do then with freedom is what we're going to talk about in this message. So I'm going to pray for us. Please pray for me. Let's all gather together before the Lord. Let's bow our heads and our hearts and ask God to bless us. The Father, holy and righteous King of all creation. Let your name be glorified here in this place among your people. 
we come to you now, Lord, and ask that you would speak. For whatever reason, Lord, you have chosen people to carry your message, to speak on your behalf. And though we know our hands and our knees are weak, Lord, our minds and our hearts wander, still you choose us to speak. And so I ask, Lord, that you would anoint me as your son. Glorify your name here in this place, Lord, through me. Bless your sons and daughters. Let them see and hear from you and you alone, Lord. We ask that every distraction in our hearts and our minds would be cast down and that you, Lord, would give us the strength and the power to focus on you right now in this place. Prepare us for this year. We have no idea what it will hold. And so we cling fast to you, God. We know that you hold us in your hands and with whatever strength we have, we hold fast to you. Prepare us for everything that you would have us do. Help us to not be like the world, Lord, just hiding in bunkers and battening down the hatches. But while the world is in fear, Lord, would you send your people out in boldness to preach the gospel? We have freedom, Lord, because we know that our lives and our eternities are in your hands. And so whatever you would have us do, prepare us to do it. Reveal yourself to us now, Lord, and humble us as your people. We need you. We desire to come after you, Lord. And so bless us now. Let this message be holy because it is about our God who is holy, holy, holy. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Bless us. Let us rejoice in you and be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, family. And so what we see that we've done with our freedom, what we ought to do with our freedom is love others and serve. But there's a third thing that I want to throw into there. And this is what I want us to do for the whole year as we follow this theme of vision. And that is with our freedom, we pursue God. That's it. With our freedom, we pursue God because if we do that with our freedom, all else will flow from that pursuit. We go after God. Freedom does not mean we're free to make our own gods. It means we're free to worship the one who was and who is and who is to come. And we want to know him as he is, not as we want him to be. So let's dive into Exodus 19. We're going to be going through a bunch of verses. Just stick with me if you can. If you get lost, ask your neighbor where we're at. Exodus 19, verse 1. In the third month, after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai, when they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and Yahweh called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. So let's stop right there. So here's the picture. They come into Sinai. There's this mountain, right? The mountain. This is Mount Sinai where all the, the stories are told and all the things that we see. And so Moses goes up and God sends him to tell the people, you saw what I did. Yes. You've seen me set you free. They have the freedom that they've been praying for. Israel was begging God for freedom for hundreds of years. God delivers them this freedom. And so now all the things that were keeping them away from God are gone. All the foreign gods they were surrounded with, that's behind them now. The slave masters that beat them and, and, and persecuted them, they're gone now. Even the one who hunted and desired their own life, gone, swallowed up. And so they are absolutely free with only God before them in the wilderness. This is everything they've been asking for. This is the freedom that God bought for them. And they've given this freedom so that they can know God. God brings them so far out of Egypt into this desert place so that he's the only thing that they can see. How many of us long for that? That time to just everybody shut up. Leave me alone. All the world, go away. Everything stops so that I can just be alone with God. We long for that, right? Israel is given this opportunity. God says to them in verse five, now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall be my own possession among all the people for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. That's awesome. They just came from being slaves and now God says, I'm gonna make you my own. You will belong to me and I will make you this priesthood, this nation, holy unto God. Verse seven, so Moses came 
and called all the elders of the people and set before them all the words which the Lord had commanded them. And all the people answered together and said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. That didn't last long, did it? And Moses brought back the words of the people to Yahweh. Okay, so here's this conversation. They're stoked. God has said, I'm going to make you all this amazing stuff. And they said, whatever God says, we're going to do. Now, we have the blessing of foresight. And we can look at Israel and go, yeah, a bunch of liars. The first thing he told you to do, you did not do, right? What is this confidence that they have? It's the freedom. He, he did all of this for us. We've seen him part the Red Sea, kill the Pharaoh, his whole army. We're busted out of this place. He's going before us. We have all of this stuff. So yes, Lord, whatever you say, we will do. And when we're on the mountaintop, it's real easy to say, whatever you say, Lord. But like Israel, we see real quick when things start happening that they don't like, they start doing their own thing. Like us. When you, if you've gone to spring break camp as a youth, you know that the last day of spring break camp, I will surrender the whole, I will go to Africa, Lord, and be shot at for your namesake. Two days later, same mess you were in. Because the real world seeps in, the concerns and the worries and all the things that we were freed from, we come back to, right? And so like Egypt or like Israel, we have this, yes, Lord, whatever you say, and family, I want us to understand that when we do that, God still loves us. Look at the way that he cares for Israel after all their complaining. After every time they said to Moses and to God, you just brought us out here to die. Knowing God himself knowing that he brought them out to protect the seed of the woman so that the line of the Messiah would be fulfilled all the way from Genesis to Revelation. And he loved these people and cared for them and desired their only good. All of that God is pouring out to them. And what do they say? You just brought us out here to die. As a father, I cannot explain to you that pain. Even just like a youth leader, I cannot tell you how many kids I've poured my life into for them to tell me, you just want to take from me. And family, how often do we do that to God? He calls us to things that are uncomfortable in our lives, situations that we're not prepared for. People get sick or we lose our loved ones or some financial situation happens and we look to God while he's pouring out love for us and we go, where are you? What are you doing? Shouldn't my life be what I think it ought to be because I am your child? Like Israel, who we look at and we go, shame, shame. We do the same thing in our lives. We will scream at God and ask him why. Family, your God loves you so deeply that he sent his only begotten son to rescue us and to buy us freedom. The freedom we have is not freedom to yell at God. The freedom we have is the freedom to when the enemy is trying to torture and to kill us. We can look to our God and go, I do not understand, but I know you. And you, Lord, are good. And you are faithful. Though I cannot see it now, I trust you. This is what our freedom is for. Find me now in verse 9. Yahweh says to Moses, behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and, you may also, and they may also believe in you forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to Yahweh. Yahweh also said to Moses, go to the people, consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their garments. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, Yahweh will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. You will set bounds for the people all around, saying, beware that you do not, do not go up to the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up. 
to the mountain. So God has given instructions to Moses, and this is, you can tell something important is happening, yes? There's a preparation, there's a consecration. Go down and cleanse them, wash them, make them right. Tell them, don't come near, don't touch this. Just come to the foot and behold, he's preparing something awesome, right? Something special is happening here. Verse 14, Moses obeys. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people, and he consecrated the people, and they washed their garments, and he said to the people, be ready. For the third day, do not go near a woman. Now, I'm going to explain that one. He's not saying women are dirty, don't touch them, right? What is happening here? God is drawing all of Israel's attention to himself. He's drawing their eyes, their ears, their hearts in, and what he's saying is don't go be distracted with your own desires, the things that you're used to, the things that you love. Look at God because this is what you need right now. So that don't, don't read into this like women are dirty. That, that's, that's not it. That's a weird reading that we put in there. Moses is telling the people something important is happening. Get ready. Now I have to ask all of us, do we have this same attitude when we come into the house of the Lord? That something important is happening and that we are preparing ourselves. I say this as, as somebody who's been with the youth for a long time. When parents treat church with a flippant heart, the kids do too. I can tell whose kids or whose parents prepare them to come to church and whose parents are yelling, throw on your shirt and shoes and get ready and just get in the car. Are we preparing our families, fathers? Are you preparing your children and helping them understand when we go into God's house, something important is happening. We're gonna prepare ourselves. We're gonna get our hearts ready before the Lord. We're gonna get all these things that we need. A pastor that I love was, was saying when he grew up, every night before church, his dad would teach him how to iron his clothes. Wow. And he did that because he would tell his son, we're gonna go in front of the king. We wanna make sure that we give him our best, right? Now I'm not advocating that everybody wears suits to church. Please don't hear that that's what I'm saying. What I'm talking about is, is our hearts ready to worship God on Sunday? Or is this just like, you know, do we have the same heart that we do when we get ready to go to a restaurant? We, got to, we just got to put on the clothes because that's what's expected of us and we show up and we don't want to get scolded for, you know, being underdressed. Or do we come before the Lord and consecrate ourselves and say, I'm about to enter into my Father's presence with his bride that he loves. Am I prepared for this? We can get so comfortable in our dad's house, we treat it like dad's house. Do you know what I mean? A um, couple years ago, I was told, hey, we're going to go to uh, Wax's house for uh, like Christmas dinner. And the quote was, it's a, like, come like you're coming to a family Christmas dinner. So I said, shoots, surf shorts and shirt, can? Wax said, No. Because family Christmas dinner is this thing that you dress up for, right? Now we can do that with our father's house. We can get so comfortable here that we're just, we forget whose presence we're in. Yes, he is our father and that is a relationship we ought to enjoy to the fullest because it was bought for us by the blood of Christ. But please don't forget who our father is. God Almighty, before whom the seraphim created to be in his presence, must cover their face and their feet. He is so holy that that is the only descriptor in all of the Bible that is attributed to God three times. Holy, holy, holy. This is whose presence we come into. So like Moses preparing the people here, let us prepare our hearts to come into the presence of our king. Yeah? Find me now in verse 14. We're gonna see how God reveals himself to these people. So Moses goes down from the mountain to the people and he consecrated them and they washed their garments and he said to the people, be ready for the third day, do not go near a woman. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there was thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled and Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God as they stood at the foot of the mountain. Just picture this. Okay, Moses has been going up and down this mountain having conversations. He goes down to Israel and, you know, hey, prepare yourselves, get ready, we're going to go. On Mount Sinai, thunder, lightning, smoke. There is this loud trumpet and all the people in Israel, it says they tremble, they're shaking, right? And Moses says, let's go. <laughs> and he takes them to the foot of this mountain. So they're not far away now. 
They are standing at the base of this thing and all they are seeing is God revealing himself to these people. This is how God chooses to reveal himself to his people, right? This is not like God stepped down and then all creation just tried to figure out what to do. This is how God chooses to reveal himself all of this stuff, right? Why? Again, he's drawing them to him. He wants them to look at him and him alone. Right? You know how like when we're in church, we get sleepy, we fall asleep, we check in our phones, and a guy's sneezing and scratching and a baby's crying and we're doing all the stuff? Yeah, there's no doing that on Mount Sinai. I don't care what else is happening. Your attention is nowhere else, guaranteed. They're all beholding God. Now, here's the two things I want us to see. One, God is making very clear there is no similarity between Israel and Israel's God. He is declaring himself holy because Israel has been a land, in a land of foreign gods. They all look like something that somebody else made. When they see their God, he is different than everything, including them. The word goes out of the way to make sure we understand God is not like us. And we praise him for that. Because if he were like us, we would all be a mess. And so his holiness, right, this, this lightning and this thunder and this power that is sitting on this mountain is meant to draw Israel to all. This is the God who brought us up out of Egypt. This is the God who calls us his own. This is the God who desires to make us a holy nation. And they're shaking. They should be. Every time God does something like this, reveals himself in power, there is this falling and this trembling, right? There's a seriousness that Moses is preparing them for. God sees the hearts of Israel and not just their clothes, so he's cleansing all of them, right? Verse 18, now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because Yahweh had descended upon it in fire. Now there's fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. Now there's an earthquake. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke to God and God answered him with thunder. You thought this picture was crazy before. Now there is fire such that there's this huge plume of smoke. It's not just sitting on the mountain now. So there's this fire, the lightning, the thunder, and then the mountains start shaking. And Moses talks to God. This is what I love about Moses. He understands so beautifully the holiness of God and the relationship he ought to have. He does not come to God flippantly ever. He knows who's on that mountain. He's seeing the same thing that Israel's seeing. And while Israel is shaking, Moses speaks with God. And when God answers, God answers in thunder. That's a trip. Imagine Israel. They're sitting back watching this happen. Moses has been going up and down. Moses stands before this mountain while they're all shaking. He speaks to God and the answer is thunder. Why does God do this? God does this not just with Moses but with the sun. Matthew 17, this will be overhead. This is the transfiguration, right? While he was speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. God spoke in such a way that these disciples who were real close to Jesus fell to the ground. They were witnessing something great, right? And it's not just then, John 12, same thing. Jesus says, now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it thundered. Others are saying an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for yours. God speaks again in thunder. Why? Because he's affirming the messenger. God is speaking in such a mighty and powerful way to the one he sent so that the world will know I have sent this one. And so even when Jesus speaks, right, there's this clear message. And what do people hear? Thunder. This voice, this booming power, right? Now, Waxer said earlier today in the message, 
God has spoken in many times through many ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us through the Son. Christ is the most clear message that God gives us. If you need to know what God is saying to you, and you feel like you cannot hear him by any other means, look to Jesus. And that will speak volumes to you about how deeply you are loved, about how great God is, about how much he considers and loves and thinks of you. Look to Christ. Find me now in Exodus 20, verse 2. In between there and where we're at, God tells Moses, go down and warn the people, prepare the peace. You and Aaron come up. I'm going to talk with you guys. Exodus 20, verse 2. I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Cool. That's the first commandment. Yes? Anything confusing about that? Just check it. That's the first one. He's going to give the rest of the Ten Commandments, right? He gives all of them to Moses. And then verse 18, jump down to verse 18. So this is right after God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. Verse 18, all the people perceived the thunder and the lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But let not God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. Oh, okay, now we get it. This is why God comes the way that he does, because he wants Israel to have the fear of the Lord. Now, often when I'm speaking to people who are not believers and I bring up the fear of the Lord, there's this animosity almost, right? Why would God want me to fear him? Would a loving God want me to fear him? And the answer is, yeah. Why does a loving God want me to fear him? So that he can be respected and revered? No, to keep you safe. What does it say here? It says that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. Family, listen, we need to understand the depth of God's love, the tenderness he has for us, his care for us as his children, but we also need to understand the fear of the Lord. Now, if we have one without the other, we're gonna get all jammed up. If it's just all love, we're gonna do whatever we want because we know we can always jump back in his lap. And we think that there's no consequence. Jesus paid it all, there's no consequence for my sin. <laughs> no. We also cannot be all the fear of the Lord because then we will never enjoy him. If it's just all rigidness and legalism and I have to do the things and I'm afraid to move because what if I do the wrong thing? It'll cripple us. That's not freedom. Freedom is found in the love of the Lord and in the fear of the Lord. The love of the Lord empowers us to move forward. The fear of the Lord keeps us in the boundaries where we need to be. With those two things, we walk in accordance with his will. And so God reveals himself this way so that the people will fear him. <clears throat> Find me in verse 21. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. And Yahweh said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. And he says again, you shall not make other gods besides me, gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. So the first time he says, don't have any other gods before me. This time he specifies, don't make gods of silver or gold, don't make them. Again, any questions? Okay, just checking. Very clear command. Now, notice Moses goes up, right? Now you've got to understand Israel's respect for Moses in this moment. None of them even will draw close and Moses walks into the presence of the Lord and comes down and goes, this is what God said. And all they heard was <laughs> And he comes down and he tells them these things. <clears throat> and so Israel stands at a distance and they watch, right? They cannot go into the presence and so Moses is with God. God gives Moses all the laws for the people, how to treat each other, how to deal with justice, how to be set apart from the Lord. He promises this conquest of Canaan. It's this beautiful moment where Moses is just getting, like he's not even saying anything. God is just 
ministering to Moses, and he's taking this all in to go deliver to the people, right? Now, Moses takes this and brings it to the people. This will be overhead for you, Exodus 24. Then Moses took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. Ugh. They want to. They're excited. Exodus 24, 16, again, overhead. The glory of Yahweh rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called Moses from the midst of the cloud. And to the eyes of the sons of Israel, the appearance of the glory of Yahweh was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. Moses entered into the midst of the cloud as he went up to the mountains. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Again, pick, just picture this, right? God's chosen spokesman waltzes up this mountain into what is fire and thunder and lightning. And he don't come back. Right, he's been going up and down and so they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting and 40 days, he doesn't come down. Now Israel, of course, thinks he's dead. With all the stuff happening on the mountain, he gone, he ain't coming back. So Moses, but what's happening is Moses is sitting on the mountain and he's receiving all this revelation from God. God is telling him the plans for the tabernacle. You know all the stuff that you skip over in Exodus? The stuff that we're in our reading plan and we're like, bro, what am I supposed to learn from this? <laughs> when you're reading through the instructions for the tabernacle, understand two things. One, every piece of that has some symbolism that God is trying to reveal to us about his character, who we are, our relationship with him, all of that. More than that, for those who don't get into that kind of deep stuff, here's what I want you to see. If God is that detailed about a tent, how much more so does he care for you? How detailed are his desires for you, his heart for you, his spirit for you? How much more intricately does the son and the spirit pray for you if he's that concerned about a tent? When you read every detail, just remind yourself, his thoughts for me outnumber the grains of sand. So when you read through the tabernacle, don't tune out. Pay attention. God is a God of detail. He sees the grand and he sees the minute and he cares for all of it. So now Moses is sitting up there, right? He's hearing all this incredible stuff. These pictures are being given to him, all this instruction. So now imagine this is a movie, right? And Moses is sitting up there and it's this sweet thing. And then the camera cuts to Israel. Go to Exodus 32. Exodus 32 is entitled, The Golden Calf. Moses is sitting up there getting all this sweet revelation. We cut to Israel, the golden calf. Exodus 32, verse 1. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, No way. Nope. Aaron said to them, Tear off your gold rings, which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters. Bring them to me. All the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears, brought them to Aaron. He took them from their hand, fashioned it with a graving tool, and made into it a molten calf. And they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh. He takes the holy name of God and attributes it to an idol. This is blasphemy of the highest degree. Does Aaron think so? No way. Aaron thinks he's honoring Yahweh by just claiming his name, doesn't he? We're doing this to worship Yahweh. Does God see this and go, it's all right, their heart's in the right place. <laughs> no, the answer's no. Read the rest of Exodus. There is a severe reaction from God because of this. And there ought to be, because the God who brought them out of Egypt, Israel has tried to make into this thing. 
And they've now attributed this thing with the name of God, which is holy. I need us to understand this point. Just because our hearts are in the right place does not mean that our lives or our worship are acceptable to God. Because it is about what he commands us to do and not about what we think ought to be done. God has revealed himself. Now, God is too scary for the Israelites, right? They don't want to go up to the mountain. They, they can see Mount Sinai from where they're at. While they're making the calf, the mountain is on fire. God has spoken already. They have seen him. And still they go, Aaron, try make us one? Because God, as he revealed himself, was too scary for them. They didn't like him as he was, so they tried to make him as he ought to be. Here's what we often miss. They take the gold and give it to Aaron. Where did the gold come from? Egypt. All the precious things that you have from this foreign land, bring them to me. I will collect them and I will fashion you a God. All the stuff from Egypt that you found that was treasure, bring it to me. You know what's sad is God is later gonna ask them for this gold to build the tabernacle. And much of it is already gone because it was given to a foreign God. Now, I don't think we really understand the ridiculousness of this. Is there anybody taking notes? Can you raise your hand if you have like a notebook with paper in it? Anybody? Can you, three of you, rip out a piece of paper and just bring it up to me, please? God has revealed himself to his people, right? And they want to fashion this thing and create it, right? Thank you. One, two, three. Perfect. Thank you so much. Behold your God. This is the one who has died for your sins. This is the one who brought you out of Egypt. And we all go, ha, 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 stupid. And we should, because that's ridiculous. But we do this all the time. Do you see how ridiculous this is? It wouldn't look any better if I was a sculptor. If I could make something real, like if I was origami, I could make this some dragon or whatever, it wouldn't look any better because I made this. Can anything fashioned by my hands save any of you? No, not even a little bit. And so we're foolish to do this, but we do this all the time. We take the precious things from the life that we lived before and we try to bring that into the world now and throw it into the fire and hope that God looks like that. I'm gonna love God as long as he lets me do what I used to do. As long as he wants me to be holy, but not too holy. As long as he calls me to do things that I'm comfortable with, like a little bit out of my comfort zone, but then, you know, I, I, want, I want God to look like this and give me that. I've heard so many testimonies of like, God, if you do this, then I will worship you. Why do we do that? Because God, as he is, is scary. There are so many things about God we don't understand. And we cannot understand. We don't have the faculty in our brains to comprehend the weight of his glory. There are so many things he does that we would not do. Not only would we disagree with him, we're angry with him for doing these things. And so rather than come to him and worship him as he is, we take the pieces of him that we like and worship that. I always wondered, why did Israel make a calf? I, out of all that, you could have made a lion. You know what I mean? Like something, just, yeah. <laughs> it's because they wanted to make an animal gentle and docile enough for them to pet, but not one so fearsome that they could not draw near to. See, the calf still had some, some strength, right? It was a young bull but it was docile enough for them to draw near to. It looked shiny enough for them to be attractive to their own eyes, right? This thing of gold. They wanted God, but they wanted God as they wanted God, not as he was. Family, we cannot do this. So many of us will do this thing where we compromise with God. I know the Bible says not to do this, but it's 2023. Isn't this like some old thing? Does the Bible really say, is it really that bad if I, well, we love each other, whatever it might be. We have all these weird things that we try to throw into the fire to make a God that's comfortable with us. 
family. Any improvement we try to make upon God steals from his infinite glory. We cannot improve upon God. He is the one upon whom there cannot be an improvement because he is the perfection of all things. Any adjustment we attempt to make to God robs him of what he ought to have. Family, this year, if we're seeking God for vision, we need to understand that he might give us vision we're not ready for, that we're not comfortable with, that is gonna call us out of our comfort zone into things that we don't like. What will we do? Will we stare at the mountain and go scary and create our own God who won't call us to be uncomfortable? Will we send the the, the chosen one into the mountain to go speak to God on our behalf because we don't want to hear from him? How many of us have asked God to speak and he told us something that we didn't like and we went, never mind. Lord, just speak to me. Tell me what you want me to do. I want you to go tell this person about Jesus. Try again, Lord. (laughs) Tell me to go read my Bible or something, right? No, no, I want you to surrender your life to me and put yourself in a situation where you feel like you're not comfortable for the sake and the glory of my name. Will our answer be, yes, Lord? Or will it be, I'm just not ready yet? Family, whatever God commands us to do has less to do with us and more to do with who he is. And if we trust who he is, do we trust in a God who gives and takes away? Because we love the God who gives. Mm -hmm, Amen, all day, hallelujah. We sing songs to that one. But the same God takes from us. And he has every right to do so because all that we have belongs to him. Job says this. Then Job arose, this will be overhead. Then Job arose and tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground in worship. Then he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of Yahweh. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. I want to make very clear here what Job said. Yahweh gave. Yahweh took away. What was taken from Job? Everything. Except his wife. I'm going to have questions for the Lord about that one. (laughs) Yahweh gives. And Yahweh takes. Blessed be the name of the holy God of Israel. Family, whether God will give to us this year or take from us, will we worship him as he is? Because what you're gonna see on media and all the Christian circles is this is your year, the year of promise. Claim your blessings. All this stuff. Cool, go for it. But if the Lord God Almighty should take, is he still worthy of glory and honor and praise? The Lord gives and the Lord takes. Blessed be his name. And so my invitation to us is we have to know God as he is, not as we would have him be. Right, because a God made in our own image cannot save us. Um, We're gonna skip that last slide there, Anna. It is ridiculous for the creator to worship the creation. Right, in Isaiah, just real quick, there's this section about the other gods and God kind of is mocking them. Like they, they take this God, They make it with their own hands, they put it on their back, they set it in a place and they fall down and worship it. And it's supposed to draw this picture of like, that's ridiculous. It would also be ridiculous for our creator to worship us, to obey everything that we tell him. When we pray to God, please understand we are making requests and not demands. And God has no reason to give us anything other than his own goodness his own kindness and his own mercy. And whatever he does not give us is because our Father only gives us good gifts. Only gives us good gifts. We cannot make God in our image because he is perfect as he is. God is what we need. He is our hope. He is our refuge. He is our salvation. He is our God. Now, how do we know him? The word. If you want to know God, pick this up. Feast on this. Know who God is. There's going to be a lot of stuff in here that you are uncomfortable with. Good. You should be. Because you are beholding someone who is greater than us. 
You are beholding someone who is more loving than us, more kind than us, more mighty than us, that we cannot fathom or wrap our heads around. So yes, we will be uncomfortable as we learn about God. Good. What do we do in those moments that we're uncomfortable with? Trust him. Because we know the good stuff. We know that he loves us and he cares for us. We know all these beautiful things. Lean on that when you see God and he's uncomfortable. Now for the person who says, I have my own relationship with God, I don't need the Bible, and I don't need the church. You do not have a relationship with the God who created you. You have a relationship with the God you have created. And that God cannot save you. Why is God so zealous and angry about idols? It's because they cannot save his people. It is an assault to his holiness and to his name. So family, the true and living God makes a way for us to know him. And it is by his word, by the Son, through the power of the Spirit, spend time reading. Now, I'm beating this drum because I want us to understand the safest and most solid way to know God's voice is right here. Often we will hear God's voice and sometimes we will be wrong. You wanna know how you cannot miss? Right here. If you hear God's voice, run it back through this filter. Test all things according to the word. But feast on this. That yearly Bible plan that we give up on in January, keep going. Read, feast. Now, this is my last thing. All of us have the blessing and the privilege to go into the presence of God on our own. We don't have to be like Israel who sat far back and sent Moses. And this is how it was all before Christ came. Moses goes into the presence of the Lord. The people sit outside. God cannot be with them because they're sin. And so what does God do? He builds a tabernacle to be with them. And even then, only the, the high priest can go in once a year to make atonement for sin. Even when they build the temple, there's all of these sections, right? You have the Gentile court way outside of the Holy of Holies. Then you have the women's court. Then you have the Jews' court. Then you have three other sections in the Holy of Holies only the priest can go into. And so if you want to see God, too bad. You got to sit all the way off. And they're just waiting for this one guy to go in and come out and say, everything's still okay. Family, the veil of that section of the temple has been torn. God has split it open by the blood of his son so that we can all go directly to him ourselves. Do not settle for sending God's chosen spokesman into the tabernacle for you and just going, what did he say? You tell me what he said and I'll go do that. God said of his people, be a kingdom of priests. That means everybody. How can we all be priests if only one of us goes into the Holy of Holies? Every single day, you can sit with the God who made you as he speaks to your soul. You can feast on this, eat and live. Not only live, now go out and be a fountain of living water to the world. Family, seek him. This is what God has offered us. If we want vision from him, we must sit with him. Yes. My brothers and sisters in Christ, be in the word this year. Feast, eat, ask questions, dig, because I promise you there's such treasure in here. Now, I know there's the distractions. I get it. I have a cell phone too, right? I understand. But I promise you, your time in this will yield much more fruit than your time on your phone, right? People getting hit and falling down will still be funny tomorrow, right? All the politicians are still gonna be arguing tomorrow. Everything you watch on YouTube is gonna be the same thing. It'll be there. Let it be there. This is food for your soul. Family, eat. Feast on the word of God. Let it nourish and strengthen us because this is how God shows us who he is. Understand that when we take communion, this is the God that we're coming to. The broken bread representing the broken body of our God. The blood spilled to wash us clean of the new covenant. We bring these things together and we sit with him and we enjoy him as he is. All of us are to be a kingdom of priests. Come to God as he is. Worship him as he is. Feast on the word and seek vision from him this year. If we all do that, this church won't have enough room for the people that God will bring. 
And I hope that that happens. If every one of us wins one soul this year, there will not be room in this sanctuary. And I'm very okay with that. Because if God is going to bring that many people, he will make a way. I love you guys. I really do. And if this is the last message I ever give, please hear me say this. Go after God. Pursue him daily. Be in the word and seek vision from him, and I promise you he will change you. He will make you like Jesus, and that is the greatest treasure of our heart. You are so loved by the God who created you. Aloha, I'm Cindy, and I'm one of the ministry leaders here at One Love. I also happen to be married to one of the most handsome pastors here on staff. Do I get points for that, Waxer? Anyway, I want to say thank you for tuning in today. We hope that you were inspired and strengthened with today's celebration. If you're new to One Love, we encourage you to visit us online at onelove.org and fill out a connect card so we can keep you up to date with all the things happening here. While you're there, you can also learn more about One Love, submit prayer requests, or see more of our studies through the Bible. There are many ways to stay connected, so we encourage you to take the first step. If you are watching today's celebration via YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to keep informed with new messages. Most importantly, if you have made a decision to follow Christ today, we encourage you to click on our I Said Yes to Christ link at the bottom of our website and fill out the form so we can stay connected. Or call us at 955-9335 and let us pray with you. Our ministry leaders are ready to serve you. One last thing, if you want to learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to visit goodnewshawaii.com. There, you will find five short videos about living a life in Christ and a free discipleship booklet designed to encourage your faith. Mahalo for tuning in to One Love Today. We hope that you are blessed by our time together. Aloha.